welcome everybody to this July 22nd, 2019 City Council meeting and we are delighted to begin with a public forum and happy to see you all here to talk to us. So, um, we will begin with a public forum. I'm just going to remind you of the rules today. The public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the City Council on any city-related issues except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. Each person will have three minutes to speak. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward if known. The timer and lights indicate the time you have to speak. The red light indicates the end of three minutes. We have 26 speakers. And just a reminder, we like to be a respectful place. So everybody give each speaker a good quiet room in which to talk. There's a warm-up chair. I'll read two names. The second name can sit in the warm-up chair so that we move smoothly through the process. And with that, I will begin. We have Joel Aboa first, followed by Hope Vasher. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Joel Aboa, for the record. I'm, I live in the Whitaker, so I believe it's... District 7, uh, Councillor Soret, um, and I'm here to speak to you on behalf of the Eugene Human Rights Commission. Um, earlier today, just now, you had the opportunity to vote on a resolution condemning white nationalism and, and white supremacy. Um, while I, uh, not every one of you voted yes, I would like to thank you all for um, explicitly coming out and saying that uh, white nationalism and the actions it represents is wrong. So I appreciate you, um, every one of you, for uh, for mentioning that um, explicitly. Uh, the Human Rights Commission, um, its goal is to make sure that every person in our city feels safe. Um, and in passing this resolution today, uh, I believe you've taken a critical first step in that direction. And I look forward to working um, with Mayor Venice, the city manager, um, and the rest of council uh, to make Eugene uh, the best place to live. Uh, and I also wanted to quickly uh, while I have the time, mention some of our organizational and business endorsers. Um, this was not an effort singularly from the Human Rights Commission. We had a number of um, endorsers um, in, in our Eugene business community and also a local community. So uh, I'm going to read them out um, right now. So for organizational signers, we had 350 Eugene, the African American Caucus, CARE Oregon, CAUSA Oregon, Central Latino Americano. Community Alliance of Lane County, the Eugene Education Association, the Eugene Islamic Center, the Eugene Springfield NAACP, the Eugene Springfield Solidarity Network, um, GLAD, also known as a Grupo de Acción Directa del Condado de Lane, a direct action group of, for, the, for the county, for Lane County, <laughs> GTFF 3554, Puerto de la Familia, Jewish Community Relations Council, Jewish Federation of Lane County, Latinx Alliance of Lane County, Oregon Justice Resource Center, Refugee Resettlement Coalition of Lane County, the Rural Organizing Project, SEIU Local 503, <coughs> Sierra Club, Mini Rivers Group, Springfield Eugene, Standing Up for Racial Justice, Temple Beth Israel, Transponder, UFCW Local 555, and the Western State Center. And for the business endorsers, we had the American Traditional Barbershop, As You Like It, Capella Market, Full Circle Fitness, House of Records, and Eugene Real Estate, New Day Bakery and World Cafe, Old Nick's Pub, Spectrum Cafe, and the Threadbare Print House. As you can see, the list of organizational uh, endorsers and business endorsers was exhaustive. Uh, just today, I was downtown and ran into a couple business owners, and uh, I was like, "You can. You, it's too late to sign on now, but maybe after it passes, we'll do something new and make sure you can sign on." So, thank you so much for your leadership, and I look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you, Hope Fasher. Followed by Colin Farnsworth. Hello, Council. I came here today to talk about the 5G problem. I have one five feet from my driveway. Um, so I've recently found out since the last time I was here that AT&T doesn't even have a contract with this city. So AT&T is able to proliferate these um, health hazards on not just major collectors, major arterials in commercial and industrial areas, but in local neighborhoods. I live on a place, it's a partial dead end street across the street from a grade school. 
And AT&T can come at will. They send out their subcontractor, Mass Tech. You never know when they're coming. They've damaged the end school, the speed, the uh, school zone sign that's adjacent to the new eWeb pole that was installed. The new eWeb pole is, doesn't resemble the pole that was removed. The pole that was removed was 25 feet. The new eWeb pole is 50 feet. So they come up and they just show up at any time and you don't know what they're doing and they're, they're, they get angry if you're taking pictures of them and we remind them they're in the public right away, which you know, you've told us is they are. Um, and so I'm here to ask you to ask AT&T as other cities have done and AT&T has, AT has agreed to take a time out so we can have a community <laughs> process so we can talk about siting decisions instead of them going just anywhere they can be cited appropriately, not by schools, playgrounds, parks. You spent all this money to upgrade Tugman, and then you let the city let this pole be put right smack in the middle of the length of the park facing the playground. It just doesn't make sense. Thank you. Thank you. Colin Farnsworth, followed by Abraham Lickwarnick. There'll be 27 now. Got Colin Farnsworth, Ward 3, and uh, just our city's becoming a colony of uh, the corporate state, and you guys in action on this 5G rollout, uh, which is untested, very dangerous, you guys are becoming the pawns of this corporate state. And I know none of you guys want to be representatives to do that, and so we are here regularly to tell you, show you the evidence, show you the legal facts behind uh, what y'all need to do, and we're getting uh, more serious by the month. The Eugene City Council's behavior is bound by the very high and strict standards of the fiduciary and trust law. They cannot even act unreasonably without violating their trustees' duties. They have the duty of care, loyalty, impartiality, accountability, and the duty to preserve the public trust. You all have certainly violated some of these duties in your handling of the issues of the 5G cell towers and the antennas being installed all around Eugene. These antennas will be in front of homes, schools, hospitals, playgrounds. You have violated the public trust by permitting the untested and potentially hazardous installations of these cell towers. You have chosen money and the fear of being sued by telecom companies over the well-being and safety of the people of Eugene. You have violated quite a few laws while pursuing your 5G cell tower policies, and these are just a few of examples. You have discontinued, uh, discounted the testimony and evidence of people diagnosed with suffering from electromagnetic sensitivity you, uh, who will be assaulted by the harmful 5G radiation for 24 hours a day. Both. Thank you. Thank you. Abraham Lickwarnick, followed by Becky Bruckner. Abraham Lickwarnick, domiciled Southwest Eugene. You have violated the Oregon Constitution, your oath of office, and the natural rights of the people by not passing a moratorium halting small cell towers and 5G when instructed to do so by the people's panel over, of over 270 members of Families for Safe Technology. You will remain in violation until you pass a moratorium. You have allowed the city attorney to violate the public records law when she twice refused to provide requested emails under her false claim of con confidentiality without being reprimanded for doing so. This false claim of confidentiality or attorney-client privilege, <laughs> if unchecked, could be used to withhold future public records from those unaware of the law. The mayor or her staff unreasonably have not responded to repeated requests for a meeting with the mayor in over a month until just recently when requested once again, not something a trustee does. Mike Clark unreasonably has not responded to an email asking him to explain what he meant by saying that some of the statements that Families for Safe Technology made at a recent city council meeting were erroneous and wrong. Mike Clark, at the end of this meeting, you are required to explain your allegations or retract them. Silence from a trustee when there is a legal or moral duty to speak 
is considered fraud in the law because of the likelihood of deception. You have been silent long enough. Thank you. Becky Bruckner, followed <coughs> by Victor Odlovec. Uh, Becky Bruckner here. Uh, for eight months, our group, Families for Safe Technology, has been providing the council with solid, peer-reviewed, scientific research, testimony from doctors and PhDs, attorneys, letters, and legal research from our own legal researcher on the dangers of VMFs and 5G. We have read and hand-delivered all of these papers to the city manager and council. It has taken a great deal of time, effort, and money spent to do this job over eight months. I know because I did a lot of it. I want to know what happens to these papers. Do you read them? Do you talk together amongst yourselves about what has been presented to you? Where do these papers go? Clearly, the installation of in Eugene of 5G is a risk for public health and safety. The council, nor the FCC, nor the FDA has offered any proof that it is safe. No safety testing has been done. On February 7th, 2019, Senator Blumenthal blasts the FCC and the FDA at a Senate Commerce hearing for doing no research on 5G. April 15th, 2019, Peter DeFrazio wrote to cha Chairman of the FCC, Ajay Pai, asking for reports on safety testing for 5G, as there are no studies. I repeat, there's no studies, no safety testing. How could the council, in good conscience, have proceeded with the installation of 5G in Eugene? After all of these copious warnings, from Eugene's public at every council meeting for the last eight months. There are red flags everywhere. Why did you do this? Are you prioritizing money over our health and safety? What are you thinking? You never speak to us. We want answers now. Saying that your hands are tied because of the FCC? It's not true, and we've proved that to you. Thank you. Victor Odlovac, followed by Sabrina Siegel. This is continuing the statement of Becky. I live South Hills, Ward 4, Top of Lorraine. We want to know what are you going to do at the work session on October 9th? We want a public hearing where we talk to you ask questions and you answer our questions. We want a halt to 5G in Eugene until it can be proven safe by third-party peer-reviewed scientists, not industry-funded scientists. We have been shut out from this process. You have kept us in the dark. You have given us no notice, no public hearing, that is, is what is required. We are demanding that you halt the project and start over and reform your process so citizens are given an opportunity for meaningful contribution to the public debate. We were never asked. This was all done in secret <clears throat> starting in 2014. Many cities across the US have done emergency ordinances. Why have you not done this? Some cities have even done moratoriums and then built strong ordinances for protection from telecom invasions. We need answers from you now instead of, thank you, your time is up. This is unacceptable and won't be tolerated anymore. Follow the example of Brussels, Belgium. Get up and stand up and do something. Don't just sit there and allow us to be radiated. This radiation is as dangerous as uranium radiation. It is absolutely deadly. Read what has happened in Geneva just this week when it went in, in secret. Thank you. 
Thank you. Sabrina Siegel, followed by Suzanne Bowman. Hello, <clears throat> Council, City Manager. Um, Sabrina, uh, I'm in Allen's ward, and I want to uh, speak this to empower the Council and, and tell you that you are misguided uh, by the City Attorney here uh, on the anti-commandeering uh, Issue. Uh, this amicus brief was filed by 53 U.S. Senators, 53 U.S. Senators in support of an appeal to the Supreme Court in the case of Citizens for the Appropriate Placement of Telecommunications Facilities versus FCC. The following is the testimony of those Senators. Right, 53 senators, these words. Section 704 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and implementing federal communications, communications regulations are unconstitutional under the 10th Amendment in that they commandeer state and local zoning authorities to approve or disapprove building permits under sp specific federal mandates. State and local zoning authorities under principles articulated in New York versus United States by this honorable court may not have their processes commandeered to implement a federal policy issued by the Federal Communications Commission, which seeks to override local control over health, safety, and local land use issues regarding the siting of personal wireless services facilities, such as cell phone towers, by compelling an outcome determined by the Congress, the mandatory issuance or non-issuance of local construction permits if certain federal conditions are met. The authority of the Federal Communications Commission to commandeer the actions of local zoning authorities and mandate that they issue or not issue building permits precludes such local authorities from exercising power regarding health, safety, and local land issues and is not consistent with the 10th Amendment of the United States Constitution. Thank you. Suzanne Bowman, followed by Joshua Korn. Hi, I'm Suzanne Beeman. Oh, Beeman, thank you. Beeman, and I'm uh, now living in Southeast Eugene. And this is a continuation of what Sabrina was reading, the same um, set of comments from these senators. This case is thus a challenge to the constitutionality of Section 704 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and to the implementing regulations of the Federal Communications Commission. Section 704 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 is an attempt to compel state or local zoning officials to address the alleged public policy problems as determined by the Congress and Federal Communications Commission regarding the shortage of personal wireless service facilities, even when granting building permits for additional personal wireless service facilities in some circumstances would be inconsistent with state decisions designed to protect the health and safety of local residents. In general, we urge that this issue is of great importance because of the dramatic increase in the site and construction and use of telecommunications and radio towers in communities throughout the United States. The location of such towers near homes, schools, farms, churches, hospitals, airports, highways, and the whole host of work and home environment is of great importance to the state to local government and citizens. There is significant concern by homeowners living near potential tower sites regarding financial harm they would suffer from reductions in the value of their property if the towers were to be built. In addition, there is growing public and scientific concern over the adverse effects of radio frequency emissions emanating from cell phone, cellular phone facilities. 
Also, it is our understanding that while the FCC has established standards for the thermal effects from such radiation, the FCC has not issued emission standards based on non-thermal biological effects at below hearing levels, which may cause biological harm. Thank you. Joshua Korn, followed by, uh, I can't read this, Rob. Robert Lee Harsh. Harsh. Joshua Korn, South Eugene. Legal notice of failure to protect fundamental rights of health, safety, security, and privacy by acts of ultra virus. Notice to agent is notice to principal. Notice to principal is notice to agent. For many months, members of Families for Safe Meters and others have repeatedly presented you with credible evidence and warnings about the potential health, safety, security, and privacy problems created by the planned massive deployment of untested 5G and smart meter technology. You have knowingly and willingly chose, chosen to act ultra virus by not giving proper credence to these exhortations and by continuing to allow these potentially dangerous technologies to continue to be deployed in our community. Your decisions to allow 5G and smart meters to be deployed in our community were made, quote, beyond your power, <coughs> end quote, to make and are therefore a violation of law this is considered to be an act of ultra virus, and if judged to be so under judicial review, would result in a loss of your immunity as an officer of the Eugene City Council. This would make you vulnerable in your private capacity to civil litigation and criminal prosecution for official misconduct. <laughs> Under the doctrine of ultra virus, all of your actions, decisions, and contracts in this matter would then become null and void. You have neglected your duty as a trustee of the people and as an officer of the city of the Eugene City Council to act in good faith and to and with care to protect the health, safety, security and privacy of the people of Eugene. Thank you. Robert Lee Harsh, or Hirsch, you'll have to describe your name, followed by Barbara Wade. Robert Lee Hirsch, Southeast okay. Neighborhood. You have abused your discretion and acted unconscionably beyond your powers in the following ways. You have failed to provide the community with the alleged evidence of the safety of 5G and smart meters before giving out permits for the installation of small cell towers and allowing the deployment of smart meters. You were made aware at the time of the considerable scientific peer-reviewed evidence that electromagnetic fields, EMF, often abbreviated that way for electromagnetic fields, and their various forms can be extremely unhealthy for people and the environment. You were also made aware of the numerous other disadvantages of 5G and smart meters and the entire advanced meter infrastructure, often abbreviated AMI system. You have failed to do your due diligence to make a concerted effort to thoroughly research in a timely manner the serious allegations that you were alerted to about the various potential harm caused by 5G and smart meters including the harmful effects of millimeter and microwave EMF radiation, particularly on pregnant women, young children, 
and the elderly and highly sensitive individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara Wade, followed by Robin Bloomgarden. Hello, uh, Barbara Wade, uh, Eugene, uh, Ward 1. You have failed to notify the community with the high, about the highly credible expert testimonies and studies which were provided to you as evidence of potential dangers of 5G and smart meters dangers, which could possibly lead to major health, safety, security, and or privacy crisis. You have failed to make any public announcements, publish any information on the city's website, or hold a town hall meeting as requested on this issue as any reasonable, prudent person would do under these circumstances. This is a violation of the people's right to know. You have kept the people you claim to serve out of the loop of decision making on this vital issue, which uh, would have allowed them to do their own research and come to their own conclusions. You have failed to take action to prevent harm to the environment and all living beings by continuing to allow the installation of 5G small cell antennas and the advanced meter in infrastructure that produce potential harmful effects from pulsed millimeter and microwaves in the environment, adding to the already vast amounts of electro smog from many other wireless devices. You have failed to safeguard the people you claim to serve from possible serious financial loss due to the potential risk of the city of massive litigation from harm caused by 5G smart meters and EMF. Your awareness of potential dangers of 5G and smart meters and your substantial inaction make you personally liable for civil suits as well. You have failed to uphold the constitutionally protected Fourth Amendment rights of privacy and no search and seizure without warrant by allowing the installation of vital of a vital part of surveillance system infrastructure, which will eventually have the capability to monitor and record detailed activities in private homes and businesses. You have failed to do your duty to protect the rights of the community. Uh, the lack of credibility and certification of the independent testing of 5G and AMI uh, therefore has left us uh, being unsafe and makes this akin to indiscriminate mass public experimentation forbidden in the Nuremberg Thank Code. Thank you. Thank you. Robin Bloomgarden, followed by Kathy Ging. Robin Bloomgarden, Northwest Eugene. Um, in order to correct, and I'm just continuing it on, in order to correct your ultra virus acts and the above unconscionable failures of duty, you are morally, ethically, and legally required to now apply the precautionary principle, which should have been implemented initially. Initially, one of the definitions of the precautionary principle is the introduction of a new product or process whose ultimate effects are disputed or unknown should be resisted, or more simply put, better safe than sorry. Implementing this principle would then authorize you to prudently put a stop to the placement of 5G cell antennas. Um, and the deployment of smart meters, or at a minimum, to put a moratorium on the installation until the allegations of harm presented to you can be thoroughly investigated and reported to the community at large. The definition of ultra viris from Wikipedia. Ultra viris is a Latin phrase for beyond the powers. The ultra viris doctrine typically applies to a corporate body such as a limited company, a government department, or a local council, so that any act done by the body which is beyond its capacity to act will be considered void. Administrative law, uh, 
definition. In administrative law, an act may be judicially reviewable ultra vires in a narrow or broad sense. The narrow ultra vires applies if an administrator did not have the substantive power to make a decision or it was wrought with procedural defects. Broad ultra vires applies if there is an abuse of power for example, unreasonableness or bad faith, or failure to exercise an administrative discretion, for example, acting at the behest of another or unlawfully applying a government policy. We would like you all to respond to this tonight, all of these things that we have been talking about. And on another point, since I still have time, uh, Berkeley, California just passed a law prohibiting natural gas infrastructure in new low-rise residence buildings starting January 1st, 2020. If Berkeley can do it, Eugene can do it too. The city will include commercial buildings and larger residential structures as the state moves to develop the regulations. Please keep this in mind as you move towards whatever you're gonna do with Northwest Natural Gas. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Ging, followed by Tom Brandt. Kathy Ging, Allen's Ward. I go on record to let public stewards and future generations know that I emailed Eugene City Council today a Swiss article dated July 18th. Based on this info, you would be well advised to avoid future personal liability for yourselves and taxpayers by placing an immediate moratorium in 5G. Let Eugene learn from the negative experience seen in this article, Swiss Magazine reports, first 5G injuries in Geneva by Mark David, quotes, since 5G antenna were installed near Geneva's home, near the Geneva home, these residents suffer from various health problems. Are they victims of a tech whose dangers were not sufficiently tested? One person, a doctor, and a member of parliament speak out. What they have in common is insomnia, tinnitus, headaches, and a lot of questions. The older person had a heart issue. He had to go to the emergency room two days later. Johan, 29, is not the type to hate invasive technology. He makes his money off of finely crafted videos and films. Clip, clip. Equally disturbing, when he goes to neighboring France, pain subside. They come back, and as soon as he returns, to the city, it starts again. Installed rapidly in Switzerland, 5G antennas raise issues of health consequences of electrosmog. Johan says that he gradually is getting used to it. However, he says he will not raise children near an antenna. His neighbor, Eladan, age 50, is not doing any better. He's also in the acting business. He started having the same symptoms more acutely. It happened overnight, he says. My ears started to make very loud sounds, whereas at this time I didn't even know what tinnitus was. At the same time, he felt pains in the left side and at the back of his skull, and such violent discomfort in his heart that he thought he was having a heart attack and went to the emergency room two days later. The nurse replied that the staff are not trained to provide effects of transmitters. So he has learned to live with his earaches, but they are unbearable. And I also sent you a testimony by master permaculturalist Joshua Smith today, who's worried about the insects. And I know we all love our bees and Eugene. I'd like to recommend to you this book, Elena Freeland, Under an Eye and Eye Sky, about the space fence. And maybe you saw the space fence on TV some years ago. And so this is major news. It comes in little pieces. And then we find out what's really going to happen with artificial intelligence. OK, it's going to control all the sensors worldwide as 95% of the world gets radiated with radio frequency and microwaves. And there's a trillion new smart devices sold. Artificial intelligence will be in charge. So you, only you can stop a forest fire. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Brandt, followed by Sarah Brandt. Sarah Brandt. Well, I'll change it up a little bit here, but it's actually the same old, same old. You know, making decisions for the corporations and the developers and not for the people. It's a riverfront park, valuable public land and it's to be sold to the ever-present developers. Any of you, if you had valuable riverfront property, you would not sell it. 
a smart person would either develop it and make it more valuable or develop the land, keep it, and have revenues coming in forever. The city could do this. The city, this city council, will sell this valuable public property. The money you get for the property will be gone in a short time. And the developers will have rents and lease money coming in forever. The city could have that. This money could be coming in for the public good, for roads, infrastructure, more employment, and other needed public projects. As it is, the city council has sold the people out. Valuable public property sold to developers for their profit, not for the people. The city should hire a good developer to develop the property and have the money coming into the city general fund, owned by the city and the people, not developers. You people have been bamboozled by the people feeding you information, bad information. Your managers and developers, it will be a good, it will be good for the developers and bad for the people. We need leaders to work for the people, not for the developers. When election time comes, we will be looking at your voting records and we will vote accordingly. The people don't like these major giveaways to the developers. It's got to stop. Thank you. Sarah Barant, followed by David uh, Eigel. Sarah Barant, I live in um, Ward 1, Emily's Ward. I finally know the number. <laughs> um, it's good to be here tonight, thanks. Um, because so much that's wrong needs writing, activists mostly do the work of agitating for change, as we've heard tonight. Because of this, we're often thought of as cranks and purveyors of doom, especially we climate activists who steep ourselves, frankly, in a lot of bad news that can turn us a bit bitter, if not bitter, then angry, if not angry, then depressed. But activists are also charged with an equally important task, maybe a more important task. We get to make and hold space for visions of what could be. We dream a lot about how we can reorganize our priorities and begin the work of regenerating the culture and the planet. Climate Revolutions by Bike, a 350 affiliate, holds space for a truly beautiful vision in alignment with the city's transportation system plan. Because bicycling is a radical climate action and because we cannot create what we have not yet dreamed of, our dream is 25 by 25. 25% of trips made by bicycle by 2025. Rivers and streams of cyclists on the streets and bikeways of Eugene. I think it's all something we can get behind. We share this dream widely, committed to helping the city we love create a safer, more sustainable, climate-friendly transportation system. We support increasing bike infrastructure and the development of complete streets. The first Saturday of every month, Climate Revolutions hosts a mass bike ride creating a happy intergenerational spectacle as we flow through downtown Eugene. Maybe you've seen us. We've been through Saturday Market and along the river. Though growing in numbers, our rides lack a key ingredient. You all. And you all. Please, please, please consider joining us. We begin at Monroe Park at 2 p.m. The next ride is August 3rd, and I gave little quarter sheet invitations to your staff. Thank you very much. Hope to see you out there. Thank you. You David, can come in September, too, or October. Thank you. David Eigel, followed by Pamela Krauss. I'm David Eigel. I am a resident of the city of Eugene, and I have the honor and good fortune to have having Emily Sample represent me. Um, I have some very bad news so far to report to you. Two weeks ago, I came with my $25,000 offer to Mr. Evans for my donation to the city, if he would care to attempt to defend the rather undefendable Dunn report, which was used 
to dename Dunn Hall and I haven't heard from him. I, what's wrong here? Doesn't doesn't he believe in? I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll hear from him. We'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, Mr. Schill used Mr. Evans as a front to imply that uh, the building renaming had city council support. Of course it did not. Um, some time ago, actually a couple of years ago, ago, I created the Real Dundalk blog report, which destroys their report and is documented. But since then, I've done additional work. I've gone into the archives, things that the historians claim to have looked at. This includes the fact that uh, a document which specifically states that Professor Dunn was not a member of the Fraternal Order of the Klan from the 1930s. Uh, that's not in my report. Uh, also, another document is talking about Professor Dunn uh, in the summer of 1923 when he was allegedly here running the Klan. He's actually leading a tour in Europe, visiting the most Catholic countries in the world. And in the spring before that, he's talking about the upcoming tour, and he mentioned that a few years before he had been in an honorary captain in the Italian army, which is a rather strange thing for a man who's running a Catholic baiting organization. I find that very odd. Um, there's more and more, which I'll be furnishing you in writing. Sorry, I haven't done more already. I've been distracted the last couple of weeks. Um, an interesting fun fact is that in the early 1930s, the allegedly violent white supremacist Professor Dunn was actually voted, this academic, this brilliant classic scholar, very scholarly man, was voted the most courteous man on campus. Doesn't quite fit, does it? Well, I would again urge the council to simply pass a resolution, tell the truth, cost you no money, and simply say, we didn't take a position on this. You didn't, so why not do it? Thank you so much. And if you don't do what I asked you to do, I'm not going to sue you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh. And I do appreciate your efforts on behalf of the city, all of you. Thank you. Pamela Krause, followed by Deborah McGee. Good evening. I want to address some remarks about hate and bias in this community by giving you an example of something I witnessed. It's way more than white supremacist activity here, and it saddens me. I was riding a bus in Springfield in February, early one Sunday morning. Suddenly, three LTD people came on the bus right to a man sitting across from me who had like a sleeping bag with him. They told him to get off the bus. He didn't. They said, why are you still on the bus? He was honest. He said, I'm trying to stay warm. I noticed he was holding an all-day bus pass, which Egan gives. We had exited people from Egan that morning. It was 24 degrees. Then they asked him, where did you get on the bus? He said, Eugene. They said, get off when you get back there. They left the bus, the bus took off. I went and sat next to the man. And I said, what was that about, do you think? He said, they do not like homeless people. I said, I'm so sorry. I said, I see you're holding the bus pass. Yes, he said, I stayed at Egan last night. I said, I'm on my way to my church where I'm going to have some hot coffee and there'll be some snacks and I'm inviting you if you'd like to come with me. Would you like to do that? He said, I don't know. I went and sat back down, rode the EMX into Eugene. When we got near my stop, I said, I'm about to get off. Would you like to have coffee with me? He said, no, it doesn't matter. He meant he did not matter. That goes on in the LTD system all the time. I want you to know that. I ride the bus all the time. 
Also, I want to thank you for the bathrooms and to say please change the ordinance regulations for more rest stops. We need those just as much. And I really am sorry to say I only saw one of you, thank you, Councillor Simple, at the Tony Film event last week. It was an opportunity for community and conversation. Thank you. Deborah McGee, followed by Patty Hine. My name is Deborah McGee. I've lived in the county for almost 40 years. I know you can't keep up with everything, so you might not have noticed there was a proposal for a resolution declaring a national climate emergency. It was introduced in our US Congress. Part of the goal is to meet the agreements in the Paris Climate Accord, and we know that Mayor Venice has pledged to keep Eugene in the Paris Climate Accord. What's at stake? The fate of millions of species. In fact, what's at stake is the stability of modern civilization. The stability of modern civilization resting in the balance? Friends, that is an emergency. You would recognize the emergency if your child was bleeding under a car. You'd rush over and barehanded lift that car up. The problem for us now is that the bleeding and dying are in India and Africa, where sea level rise and droughts are displacing over a billion people, which will mean a billion climate refugees. Here, we still have some time. The solutions are within reach if we act quickly enough. We know what we're up against. We know why we're not making quick progress. Special interests get policies passed by elected bodies that protect the profits of the polluters. These laws protect their profits over our livable future and constitutional rights to life, liberty, and property, all being violated by the fossil fuel industry and our government. Sadly, in the U.S., our greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise, not decline. There was good news last week. Berkeley became the first city in the nation to say no to new gas and yes to clean energy homes and communities. In a historic and groundbreaking step in the fight against climate change, the City Council unanimously approved a gas prohibition ordinance that requires all new buildings, including new houses, apartments, and commercial buildings to be all electric. Here's something I learned I didn't know. Having gas in your home produces seven different harmful pollutants and also ultra-fine particles. Rests in Berkeley Tests in Berkeley showed that pollution levels in 60% of the homes with gas stoves exceeded the EPA's definition of clean air, meaning that the air pollution levels indoor those homes would be illegal if found outdoors. A recent study also found that gas stoves may be responsible for up to 12% of childhood asthma cases. So getting off gas improves the health of everyone's atmosphere and also a home's indoor air. This win doesn't stop with Berkeley. More than 50 cities are pursuing similar measures to require or encourage electrification. We know that burning gas is 28% of Eugene's greenhouse gas emissions. When will the city of Eugene take meaningful action to get off of fossil fuels? I hope it is very, very soon, and I hope it's before it's too late. Thank you. Patty Hine, followed by Linda Perrine. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. My name is Patty Hine. I live in the county and have happily called Eugene my home. Last year, we learned that the city's franchise agreement with Northwest Natural Gas was up for re renewal, and we saw it as an opportunity to reduce local fossil fuel use. And so we could set our city to be on time with its targets to reduce uh, and get down to our targets that we passed as policy in 2014. Just changing the terms of the agreement Seem straightforward, shorten the duration, increase the price, disincentive the uh, paying us to switch from dirty to clean, and so on, it can be done. But now we're renewing the franchise agreement, it looks like, and planning to create an additional document that has some binding policy to reduce emissions from gas while the clock ticks. You've heard about the work of the Berkeley City Council with a policy saying it will no longer allow natural gas pipes in many new buildings starting January 1. Before you say, oh, well, that's Berkeley and they're crazy, you might remember that the people who've always been on the forefront of important and necessary change have been deemed crazy because they challenged the status quo. And without a doubt, we're challenging the status quo. The status quo is blasting <clears throat> more gases in our atmosphere than our ecological life su support systems can tolerate. That's crazy. Strong policies such as Berkeley are what are needed. 
We need utility companies like PG&E in California, for heaven's sakes, to join with governments to electrify as much as we can. We can and should make policies that prohibit builders from applying for entitlements that include new gas infrastructure. We can and should require new construction to be built so it can be converted to electric easily. The transition we need is not going to come from voluntary actions and reductions. Berkeley did, however, declare a climate emergency last year, which set the stage for this new policy, and now these 50 other communities in California are aggressively considering legislation planning to phase out their gas, along with the 822 other municipalities worldwide that have declared a climate emergency, 822. So you esteemed council have power, franchise agreements, land use policies, zoning laws, incentives, disincentives, advocating, staffing choices, budgets, bonds, raising revenue, and all this power. We have power too. We have people power to get new people in office, to call out lack of progress or worse, passive resistance against the kind of change that would make a difference before climate disruption really sets in. We're in a bubble here, but it is happening. One way or another, there's going to be disruption. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Perrine, followed by Linda Heil. Uh, so tonight I understand you're going to be discussing the Northwest Natural Franchise Agreement extension. Could you just introduce yourself? I'm sorry, I'm Linda Perrine. I'm in uh, the 97405 zip code of Eugene. Um, <clears throat> So uh, the one-year proposed extension is another form of kicking the can down the road. Uh, as you've just heard, we really need to be taking aggressive steps today, now. Um, I prefer the Berkeley approach of a moratorium on January 1st, but to meet the IPCC scientist requirements, they are suggesting 50% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030 and 100% by 2050. That would be a clear line in the sand and a clear directive to Northwest Natural that that is what this community wants to see in terms of climate action. Uh, what you heard in some of the work sessions with them is a lot of tap dancing in all kinds of ways to try and avoid those kinds of clear directives. It's really up to the city council to make a clear line in the sand. You have the option of putting a moratorium in in January 1st, but you could be doing something that is uh, a secondary effectivity of 50% reduction by 2030. I hope you'll consider something strong like that in the ag new agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Heil, followed by Drix. Hello, uh, Mayor and Councilors. My name is Linda Heil and I live in Ward 2. <clears throat> 350 Eugene supporters are here again tonight to show council the community's support for completing a strong, successful climate action plan. Please recognize that a member of the public has only two or three minutes twice a month at council meetings to make a case or to respond to a point uh, made by a counselor during a prior work session. Councilor Zelenka has referred to Northwest Natural several times as a willing partner in Eugene's climate action planning. The company was not willing to come forward with significant carbon reductions when they had the opportunity as a large liver shareholder last year. Their low carbon pathway calls for only 15% biogas by 2035. Nothing indicates that they are serious about reducing emissions voluntarily. In fact, their emissions increased from 2015 to 2017 by 16 percent. Transition to biogas alone isn't feasible to produce the kind of carbon reductions that Eugene needs. Requirements are also needed for more efficiency and conservation for all new buildings to use electric energy and for a transition from gas to high efficiency electric appliances over 10 years for current customers. With these changes, residents' electric bills will be lower than their current gas bills. And a prohibition on incentives for current electric customers to switch to gas is a no-brainer. Eugene will not be the first to require changes that accelerate the electrification of buildings. In 2016, Palo Alto passed a resolution requiring a carbon neutral natural gas portfolio plan. And as you surely read this week and have heard this evening, Berkeley has passed a law requiring all newly constructed buildings to be electric powered, no gas, 
Berkeley's situation is very similar to Eugene's. Gas makes up 27% of Berkeley's greenhouse gas emissions. It makes up 28% of ours. Gas accounts for 73% of Berkeley's building sector emissions, and it accounts for 92% of Eugene's. Berkeley is falling short of its Climate Action Plan goals, and Council is facing Eugene's Climate Action Plan gap. Let's join these other progressive cities in stepping up to the challenging work that must be done. Thank you. Thank you. Rix, followed by Pastor Steve Kynes. Did it start when I start talking? Sure, why not? Boom, here we go. All right, hi, my name is Drix. I'm so glad to be back here. I apologize that I haven't been here. A lot of Eugene invites me and I thank you. Um, actually, I'm at a stage of life and we all get there where it's time to go through all your stuff. So I took everything I owned and put it in the living room and now I've been avoiding it. So <laughs> that's what I've been doing. Oh look, two lamps, do I need both? Um, <laughs> You laugh every drive through Eugene, you'll see everyone's garage open, garage doors on Saturday, and they're full of stuff. Uh, no cars in there, and I, I don't know if it's an American thing or, or what, but we all got too much. Um, why am I here? I'm here because, um, well, you know, we're a great city. I'm really pro Eugene. I just think we're the center of the future, and we have the potential to be even better than that. Um, and I figure that most people come here to complain because it hits their point. I'm just gonna go tell City Hall and that's you guys. So um, yeah, but it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be any of this way. So I show up here, I'm gonna show up here more and I'm gonna be more myself. I live alone, so. I'm funny all the time. <laughs> and, oh, I laugh at stuff that doesn't make. So I'm going to share it with you guys more because why not? We're all a town. This is you, Gene, and we would want to be nowhere else. Um, G5, here's the thing I understood about G5. You guys are taking a lot of raking for it. Um, being our new government and the way they do new things is that they came up with a way that this will not be questioned by communities, by councils, by individuals, schools. Nobody can say no, and it's going in, and then our lives will be the test. Is it creepy? Yeah. So. Everybody, and when I talk to you, Gene, I'm talking to little kids, your two-year-old, one-year-old kid, they say simple things, and they're part of our family here, so we need to ask them. Stroke patients, that's something perhaps waiting for all of us, but a place where you're still smart, you've got your experience of your lifetime, but you can't move. Well, those are minds, and those are minds that are thinking, and they're, they're part of our family, so. I don't know how to coordinate all this. Maybe everyone can write to you guys, and if it gets to be a lot, then we can come up with a plan B. But it's all flexible. The world is changing, and we're Eugene. We got it. We are here. I have no idea what my notes say. Um, oh, here, there's, yeah. No, that's a song, and I don't think I'm up to singing. I live on High Street in, the, how long do I have? Oh, um, yeah, there's kids sleeping all passed out on heroin all over the neighborhood, and I just think it's interesting that we have a 20-year undeclared war in uh, Afghanistan, the world's capital of heroin, and here we are in Eugene. But I'll finish this next year when we come back. Thank you, I love you all, and you too. Thank you. Yes. Pastor Steve Kynes, followed by Cliff Gray. Hi there, I'm Pastor Steve Kimes of Eugene Mennonite Church of Ward 6. Um, so I've been going to the Nightingale rest stop uh, pretty frequently recently, and I've been talking to a guy named Chuck. Uh, Chuck has been looking for a job. He's got experience as a chef, and he's trying to get a job, and he's looking, and the reason he's looking is because he has a daughter, and uh, his daughter and her mother is in California with uh, with. Uh, the grandparents, but what he wants to do is he wants to get a job and make enough money, save enough money so he can get an apartment locally, move them up, and they can be a family together again. Uh, really great guy, and I think he's going to meet his goal. But the reason he's going to meet his goal is because he's in a rest stop, because he is in a place that has stability. I've been working with houseless folks uh, for 25 years, 
And I can tell you the one thing that every houseless person needs is stability, and the rest stops provide that. Uh, they're actually a really good program. And so there's a lot of Chucks out there. I mean, not everyone on the street is, is like Chuck, but there's a lot of folks out there that are. And they need a place to stability so that way they can uh, step up and they can have, uh, they can make the next step that they need to do. Uh, otherwise, if Chuck didn't have, or the other Chucks out there don't have a, a rest stop then, or you know an extra place to be, then they're gonna end up being a tent on the side of the river or a tent on the sidewalk or a tent in front of businesses. And it's gonna be much, much more difficult for him to get a job. Anyway, I'm just saying, yeah, you know, encouraging uh, more people to uh, having more spots and rest stops. I don't know, it just makes sense to me. That just makes sense. There is one thing though that uh, looking at it, and I realized that looking at the amendment, it'd be really great if in the proposal, uh, the staff might be given, so uh, the proposal says that, uh, that any proposed site has to be approved by city council, which is great, that's a no problem. But if there could be like a time limit for uh, that, let's say 30 to 60 days. 30 to 60 days uh, for uh, a site to be approved by the city council, that gives staff an opportunity to kind of figure out what it is that they're doing and how long they have before they need to prepare for the next step. Thank you. Thank you. Cliff Gray, followed by Stefan Streck. I think he left. Oh, did Cliff, oh, Cliff left. Okay, Stefan Streck, followed by Michael Kerrigan. All right, well, thank you very much for coming down here today. My name is Stefan Streck, and I am a recent college graduate of the University of Oregon, gorgeous liberal arts university. Uh, had a solid 1.0 GPA for the final semester, only took 10 years, and I'm quite proud of that. Um, however, today I wanna to talk about local citizens who have tried and struggled more than any of us can imagine. People living on the street, like my friend, Stephen Cavellos. And he's a Native American who has lived in Eugene his whole life, 25 years. And I've known him since I moved here over about 20 years ago now. And he was kicked out of 4J public schools. He was kicked out of the alternative schools and has no other place to go besides living on the streets and was living on the sidewalk. And then this council passed a resolution saying that he couldn't do that anymore after they said it was quite all right. I mean, that's your job, so that's why I meant just bring it up because he's such a nice guy. Like, I used to live right down next to Whitebird, so I've actually talked with a lot of the homeless people uh, in town, and a lot of them are really misjudged. Eugene's known as the bike theft capital of the world, but like, for example, I live two blocks from Whitebird. I came home one day, parked my bike out front, thought I locked it up, went inside, cooked myself dinner, had a beer, went to bed, Woke back up, cooked myself breakfast, had some coffee. And it's like, you know, 11 in the morning at that point. So I opened the door and my bike is just sitting there in the middle of the sidewalk in broad daylight. It was probably there for close to 12 hours. I didn't even notice and nobody touched it. We're talking about people that are pretty desperate and they didn't think it was worth it to try and take my bike. They're actually seriously misjudged people. They're really nice. So. I don't know what's going on with people speaking so negatively. You know, if you're gonna be nice to people, they'll be nice to you also. And I think like people like Stevie, they deserve a second chance. You know, when I turn on the TV and I see the city council just sweating and looking unhappy and talking about passing an emergency resolution to kick homeless people off the curb without any notice when they've previously just been invited and you know condoned to be there. We're talking about an emergency resolution that meant people who thought they were following the law were woken up by the police officers and the police don't wanna do that either. Nobody wants to have to wake up and just take homeless people out of their tents first thing in the morning. Anywho, I really love Eugene and I think that more can be done for people like Stevie because we've got a lot of money in this city and it's just totally being wasted. So that's my opinion, thank you.
Thank you. Michael Kerrigan, followed by Michael Gannon. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Kerrigan. I live in Ward 7. Uh, thank you for taking action earlier tonight against hate and white na uh, na nationalism. Um, and it's something that I'm really pr proud that you did, did, uh, did that tonight. Uh, I helped establish uh, the rest stop program in, in Eugene, something I'm really, really proud of. And I'm still on the board of Nightingale Hostage Shelters and Square One Village. The rest stops are very successful and we need more of them in, in Eugene to help us deal with our homeless crisis. They work, they're successful, they're a model to the world and we need more of them here uh, in, in, in town. Um, so please modify the rest stop ordinance so it's easier to place them um, in, in residential neighborhoods and near schools. There are safe and uh, secure sites that neighborhoods like the Southeast neighbors are very, very proud of. You have proclaimed that we should have a rest stop in every ward. To pull this off, we need to modify the rest stop or the ordinance. So please do that tonight. I, I also tonight stand with my 350 colleagues in support of a strong climate action plan to be fully enacted here in Eugene and to do it as soon as, as soon as possible. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And our final speaker, Michael Gannon. Good evening, Council. I live in Eugene, I'm Michael Gannon. I'm glad you're here. I'm not sure why. I began talking about crosswalks defined by the state legislature. I thought it would be an easy way to start on climate change when people were frustrated with the enormous difficulty of dealing with it. And now I've begun to really dig in and see how extremely difficult it is to deal with the city of Eugene. I think my romance with Eugene is drawing to an end. I'm in pain about it because it is a lovely city and there's many wonderful aspects to it. But I cannot understand why you take it so lightly that old people, senior citizens and young people have to cross the streets in so many unsafe ways when the legislature has given you this program of uh, defining the crosswalks. I've talked about it a number of times. I'm not making any headway. I got real excited last week when a police car went zooming past me on when I was trying to cross 6th Street and I was doing everything that the state legislature told me to do about it. And I thought, oh, wow. I think that's 010 officer, that's his vehicle. I'm gonna call the police auditor and make a complaint. I, hadn't got, I had uh, done that uh, last Monday, I believe, before I talked at the council. And afterwards I talked to two counselors who um, were I was enthusiastic that they were taking the time to talk to me because the conversations with me about climate change and, and crosswalks have gone nowhere. So I was pleasantly surprised to get a call from Carolyn Mason, whom I went to listen to talk to the police commission about getting rid of homeless people. And I thought, whoa, she's going to explain to me that they caught that policeman who sped past me in violation of Oregon traffic laws. Um, they found the driver of that car and he told her that he didn't see me. Thank you. I've made my point, I believe. Thank you. Yes, you have. Thank you very much. 
All right, that closes the public forum. Thank you all for testifying. Are there uh, councillors who wish to make comments? Councillor Semple? Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who came tonight. I will miss you until the second Monday of September. I want to talk about the resolution uh, against white nationalism that I brought from the Human Rights Commission to the council. And much to my surprise, I voted against it. I feel really uncomfortable about this. I spoke enthusiastically in favor of it at the press conference this morning. I'm horrified by white nationalism and I support the intent of the resolution. But I'm concerned by the suggestion we could be regulating people's thoughts. I have some problems with what condemning means in this instant. So I still believe in the intent of the resolution and the actions that I hope will come past it. But I would have liked to have had two more days to wordsmith it a little bit to the place where we all could have voted for it unanimously. So I'm not unhappy that it passed, but I do want to explain that, of course, my heart is behind the intent, but my mind is also watching out for what everybody's thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Any other counselors wishing to speak? Uh, Councilor Clark. I'm going to bite. Madam Attorney, a couple of questions come to me. Does the council have a legal obligation to implement a precautionary principle as it pertains to any issue particularly? Legal obligation. I have, I have, that is such a broad statement. I don't, I'm not. As it pertains to this issue specifically. Again, I, it, it's such an over-sweeping, I'm not comfortable just answering that on the fly right now. I mean, I haven't even... My understanding... I'd like the, to do legal research to give legal advice. That is my principle. Okay. So I, 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 I do not want to do that for you on the fly. Do you understand the essence of my question? A little bit, but I would like to know more specifically of what you're asking. And it's a I more common that. legal principle in Europe than it is here to operate based on the precautionary principle, where here we tend to operate on the proof of harm principle. In other words, we allow the largest potential for freedom in our country until such a time as something is proven harmful, and then we tend to regulate based on that. Um, whereas in more European countries, it's more common that if something could potentially be harmful, that it be regulated until such a time as it's proven safe. My question is whether we are under any legal obligation to, to act under that principle. And I would want to do legal research and okay. provide you a legal answer. Second question, are we under any legal obligation to act in the manner discussed in some of the testimony tonight, or is our lack of action putting us in any potential harm as it pertains to the 5G issue as discussed tonight? There was a lot of comments made during a whole bunch of different people's testimony. Um, so whether or, not, um, whether or not somebody can bring a lawsuit against you, Lawsuits can always be brought against sure. the city. We can be civilly held, but what I'm asking is, are we, are we affirmatively obligated in some manner that we're not acting in? Again, generally, the, it, the, 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 okay. Uh, uh, yep. Quiet down. I'm not comfortable answering really, really abstract legal right. questions. Right, I completely like understand. I'm just not You've heard it. some of the testimony tonight. It's my. It, this was what I was referring to the other day. Much like, um, and by the way, I'm not an attorney, which is why I asked ours. Um, but very much like a policeman is not legally obligated, or a policeman is not um, liable. If a crime is committed against a person because they have no affirmative obligation to keep everyone safe, their job is to do that and that's our goal. And 
their job is to investigate crimes and capture perpetrators and hold them accountable after the fact. But they don't have a legal obligation under which they could be sued to prevent all crime. And neither, as I understand it, do we have a legal obligation to prevent all harm? And that's my response. But I, again, I'm not an attorney, so that's why I asked ours. This is, you've had your public forum. I'd love it if you want to comment on that at some point, even by memo later. Thank you. Councilor Taylor. Thank you. I just wanted to say I agree with Councillor Simple's statement. And um, I would like, to, I think we've been told that there's nothing we could do about 5G. And I, if we could, I think we would. But um, I, I was. Sabrina, I will evict you if you cannot be quiet. I was impressed by the statements, by reminding me of the Declaration of Independence. Thank you. So um, I would like to just add one thing. The, the instruction has not been that you cannot do anything about 5G. I want to be clear about that. The specific question around the anti commandeering um, principle was explicitly related to adopting a moratorium. That was the very, very specific and limited scope of that question. So when we're talking about the anti-commandeering and challenging provisions and things like that, that was not what the it, um, my response was that was provided to you. It was limited to whether or not you could defend the adoption of a moratorium um, on the basis of the anti-commandeering. So I just want to make sure that um, it's clear that this it was not as broad as there is nothing you can do, and we're going to have a work session on that. Um, but I, that seems important clarification to be made right now. I'm going to speak first. Okay, thank you for that. And I also want to address the advocates for a moratorium on 5G, a couple of points, which is uh, I do have a meeting with you on Wednesday. Uh, it was delayed because I was out of town for three weeks, one of which was at the U.S. Conference of Mayors where I made a speech about 5G, strongly advocating for fellow mayors to join us in our litigation and objection to the 5G overriding local control of our rights of way. This is a critical issue. It is the fundamental issue that guides everything else. So I agree with you that the health studies have not been done. This is not something that the city of Eugene can undertake or legislate on, but we can legislate and we can call upon the FCC and take them to court and we are in the process of doing that. So we are taking a strong stand on our local right to control our rights of way. There is income related to the city of Eugene. It's a very significant issue to us, both in terms of health and in terms of our right to have authority of our rights of way. And we are doing that work. We have taken the telecom industry to court three times successfully, been upheld successfully. We do this work, we know how to do this work. We are not ignoring the dangers, and I have gone on a national stage to say so. So I just want to assure you that I am listening to you, and I will talk to you again on Wednesday. Thank you. Mayor? Yes, Michael Clark. Yeah, go Thanks. for it. I don't mean to put you on the spot, by the way, at all. I just was looking for some general guidance on those thoughts. Um, I also would like to say that not acting in a speed that is, um, is, is hoped for isn't the same thing as not acting. And I've had, since the beginning of this conversation, as it were, I've had some pretty broad questions, and I still do. And that's why I ask that we have a work session finally, and we do have one on the schedule, and that's our normal process to act. When we have an issue that we want to learn more about before we do something, we schedule a work session, and that's what we've done. So we have taken action, in fact, in our normal process to deal with the question, and we will. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Any other comments? All right, thank you so much. That closes our public hearing and comment section. We are now ready to move on to the other city council business. <clears throat> uh, can I have a motion on the consent calendar, please? 
I move to approve the items on the consent calendar. Second. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you, that passes. And now our first order of business is action on ordinance extending the term of ordinance number 20170, granting to Northwest Natural Gas Company a corporation, a 20 year non-exclusive right and franchise to lay, maintain and operate facilities in the public way within the city of Eugene, Oregon and providing for the payment of compensation to the city. So would you like to, should we put the motion on the table first or do you want to address this um, initially with some explanation? Before we do that, we don't have a presentation, Mary. We're here to answer questions. Okay. All right. Why don't we? Okay. I do this. Go ahead. I move to adopt an ordinance extending the terms of ordinance number 20170 for four months. Second. But wait. Uh, we done? Okay, yep. Second. All right, discussion, questions? Yes. My understanding was for a year. Mm -hmm. That's what our recommendation is. Okay. What's that? That's our recommendation. And so Betty's motion is for only four months? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's your choice to make that motion. I wouldn't support that because of the staff recommendation, but I'd be interested to know your rationale for changing and altering that time frame. I would also say that um, I've spoken to a couple members of EWEB's board since the last meeting where I brought this question up about their capacity to serve double to the demand, for example, if we all had electric cars, which I hope one day we all do. Um, and can we handle that level of demand from a structural point of view? And or if everybody got off of gas, how, how will we handle that? Um, it is true that a great deal of their generation will have to come from other places where it's generated by means of other means other than hydro. It's going to be and 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 sustainable means because and and this was both of these board members talking with me about this about the difference in um, in the way most people think about electricity as opposed to other kinds of uh, consumer goods or other other. Um, consumable things that they have an affirmative obligation that they put on themselves for reliability that means they can never not have enough so they always have to have enough and that that difference in demand is really significant and it's really significant across multiple communities and so when many communities put that demand on it it, it it alters that demand so much that the price differential in the first quarter per kilowatt hour was that electricity started out in one part of the first quarter at $20 per kilowatt hour and ended at $1,000 a kilowatt hour in the same quarter because of the variability of demand. And they had to pay people to burn natural gas and to do other thing, burn other things in order to generate that electricity. So. I'm really hesitant for us to take radical actions before we understand the full cost and the scope of what we're doing both to the folks in the community and to the climate by, by how that electricity will be generated that's going to result from a significant increase in demand for electricity. So I would support a year for us to have that conversation, but not four months. All right. Um I have Claire, Alan, Chris, and Betty. Do you want to speak to your motion I first? Why don't you I just, see that? I want to say the reason I said four months is that gives us time to think about, learn more about what we can do. For example, can we do what Berkeley did? And this, I understand that four months would be four months from November. Is that correct? So that is quite a while from now. And it gives us enough time to learn more about what actions we can take. Thank you. All right, Claire, uh, Councilor Sarat. Thank you. Uh, first, I'm gonna be a little bit out of order and thank the mayor and Councilor Clark for responding to the folks who spoke at the 5G public forum. I appreciate your responses. Um, 
So I was going to make a motion to amend our original motion to six months. So I uh, can actually support this uh, change of motion. I had some comments I wanted to make in general. So I'm leaning towards supporting Alan's proposal that we come to a binding agreement with Northwest Natural that would move us towards reducing our carbon emissions. But I am concerned about Northwest Natural's commitment to partnering with us on this. Um, and I fear, uh, you know, such an agreement could be result in something that's anemic, that sounds good, but doesn't result in real reductions. But perhaps the strong action by our philosophical cousin, uh, Berkeley, can serve as motivation for us and Northwest Natural to achieve uh, something real here. Um, I appreciate uh, the attempt to answer my questions from the work session about how much infrastructure Northwest Natural plans to install in this coming year, but the answer I received was so vague as to be useless. They said uh, something like 1.4% in the general area over 20 years. That was not what I was trying to find out. So uh, maybe I needed to be more specific. I was hoping to learn how many new customers do they expect to bring on board? How many new homes are they planning to connect to natural gas in that year extension that we potentially were going to grant them? Um, getting the percentage over the next 20 years does not give me any information of value as a city councilor. If Northwest Natural is truly interested in being a partner with us in this effort, I encourage them to provide us with information that is meaningful to this council and that understands the context in which we operate as city councilors. For my part, I will do better to be more specific in posing my questions so that I can get information I need to represent the best interests of my community and constituents. So I would like us to move more quickly in this process, so that's why I was going to propose six months, um, that four months will work for me, and to spend that time between now and then to develop a robust binding agreement that brings Northwest Natural along as a true partner in measurable target with measurable targets and accountability to start reducing our carbon emissions and to explore ways in which we can bring other modes of energy online. Thank you. Elsa Zelenka. Yeah, I'm not sure how long this process should take, so I asked staff to uh, come up with a timeline of the, the things that need to occur in order for us to get to approval of a franchise fee agreement. <coughs> and to do that, and if we were going along the bilateral enforceable agreement, We'd have to negotiate that. Then that has to come to council for approval and go through our process. And then we would then go in to the franchise fee agreement process. And those can overlap a bit. But um, so four month extension really means do all of that in seven months. And I'm not sure that's actually realistic at all. Um, and I'm not so, so sure a year is either, but did staff take a stab at doing a timeline and, and can they share that information with us? As embedded in that also is that I think that the uh, cap and trade bill 2020, which will impact this negotiations, I think it could be a very formidable uh, component of it, is probably gonna come up in the 2020 session in February for the short session. So by the end of March, we will know how that then turns out and impacts us. Seven months, four month extension is really seven months from now, mm -hmm. which actually means by the end of February. So before that session starts, we will have completed this. And that gives me pause because I think that needs to be integrated back into this process. Comments on the timeline? Councilor Lake, uh, 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 Madam Mayor, uh, um, Ethan Nelson, Intergovernmental Relations, and Mike Streepy, uh, Finance. So Mike put together a uh, um, kind of a broad-based uh, schedule for um, that integrated some of the input we, put, we had as a team related to uh, finance process, um, working uh, through city attorney's process, and also um, negotiating with Northwest Natural, and as Councilor Zelenka said, back and forth. And then as well, um, trying to time if there are uh, actions in an executive order, which uh, uh, Governor Brown is, has signaled that she's working on, and also if the legislative session that starts in early February, uh, they take on HB 2020 or, or a, a modified version of that. You know, that, all of that uh, kind of 
complicates and continues on what we had been bringing to you in the rationale uh, for that extension, that one year extension. And so we still stand by the need for 12 months um, to do due diligence, do really good work and be able to come back to council with a pathway that we've worked uh, um, kind of uh, at different stages with you, either through executive session and the negotiations or bringing together packages to say, you know, what does this look like in regards to uh, maybe the, the standalone agreement versus what's in the right of way franchise versus what could be done outside of any of that. And, and there's been mention of the um, Berkeley the City Council passing an, an ordinance. And so similarly, those types of policy actions could be part of the um, climate action plans gap strategies. And so it's kind of complicated, you know that, and we're working to really try to figure on out how best to lay that in front of you in a deliberate manner so that you can um, make good choices and be well informed on the, those, those information. Yeah, and I, I think the current concern is too that if we go too short, we'd have to come back for another extension as well. Um, and the possibility um, that they could be operating without a franchise in place. You know, one of the things about this agreement is that it, it'll be very complicated. It's never been done before. And so it's not like there's a template to go use. So my negotiations in my personal career that have been one off have been very complicated and take a lot of time. So if we push this so that we don't have enough time to deal with it, we will do a poor job. Uh, Chris says you can have a fast, cheaper right. Pick two. I totally agree with that. It hasn't let me down yet. Uh, so if you want it fast, it's not going to be right. And uh, that's, that's a problem with this. If we can't come to agreement with Northwest Natural in a reasonable amount of time, then we always have the franchise fee to fall back on. So, um, but giving enough time to deal with that, giving enough time to um, have the legislature try to act another cap and trade bill in the short session, uh, which would be over in March-ish, it's a 30-day session, so it'll be over the beginning of March. Um, it, and then, so if you went a couple of months past that, say the end of June, which would be about a eight or nine month session uh, extension beyond the November 1st deadline, um, that that would, November 11th, November 11th um, deadline, that, that seems like a reasonable amount of time to take all this into consideration and do what will be a pretty difficult task. You want a motion? Uh, not, well, let me, one, Chris can speak and then if we want to amend, we can do that. Okay, Chris? Actually, I, I may kind of wind up doing both because um, actually Alan saved me time. He asked all the same questions that I was going to ask. <laughs> um, having in previous life been the staff that supports an elected board, um, I'm very sensitive to the notion of the elected sitting up here and going, make it so, and the next meeting, make it so, and the next meeting, make it so, and pretty soon we're just completely overloaded. So I think the question about how quickly can you get things done is a, is a really significant one. It's not that the desire is not there to do it. It's I'm just absolutely speaking on a workload um, question. And so I think if um, it's going to take longer not only to, to converge with other things that are going on, but also to manage the workload that we're going to be under, because I'm very aware that there's a number of issues going on right now that are demanding a huge amount of staff time around housing, around homelessness, around public safety, and this is just adding more onto it. So um, I would make um, a motion to amend uh, to one year. Second. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, Jennifer, Jennifer go for it. Yes, please. Yeah, so um, I totally understand what you're saying, Chris, and I think it, we need to take into consideration staff time, but that's not what I heard. What I heard was we want to wait and see what the state does, and we already did that. And we can't just keep putting it off, well, the state will do it next time, the state will do it next time. We have to at some point say, we're just going to go forward, we're going to do what we're going to do, and if the state changes something at some point, we'll reassess. You know, we can't just wait for them forever. So. I'm okay with six months, I'm okay with four months, an entire year, which is actually more than a year, because we don't start until November, so it's extra time than a year. Um, it just seems like more time than we need. I think we've talked about this issue for a long time, we've discussed some options, and it's just, we just need to get in there and make, start making some decisions. Councilor Seppel. 
Thank you. Uh, I think six months is a, is a good compromise. Um, we were going to have it done by this November, and we've been going around about different things thinking that we would do it by November. So there's a lot of stuff already on the table that we've been considering. And to give us a, a whole nother year when right now we're due in November and, and we're not ready. So um, I would be much more comfortable with a six month extension, which is really, you know, plus till November. Um, I think this is important. I also think it's important to do it right. And we've already had a lot of discussion about it. But I do know staff is, is we keep throwing it at you. But we also have a lot of people who this is really important. So I like the six months. Okay, so uh, I just wanna make sure I get my sequence right. So what's on the table currently is a six month motion. It's no, what's on the a table is, amendment. A, is an amendment. Uh, um, so Councilor Pryor made a motion to amend um, to make it the four month one year. Right. And that got a okay, second. So that's so that what's is on the table. All right, we've talked about six months, but that's not table. a motion right. yet. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, so what's on the table is one year. Mike, uh, Mike you want to speak to that? Is that what you're raising your hand for? Yeah, it was. If this motion fails, and those, if if a majority of us vote no, I'll move to amend to six months. All right, perfect. All right, ready to vote on the one year change. All in favor of the amendment to change it to a timeline to one year. All in favor, one, two, three. Opposed, one, two, three, four. Okay, that fails. So now, Councilor Clark. Move to amend to six months. Second. Okay, any discussion about that? All right, all in favor to amend the, nope, nope. All, right. nope. all in favor to amend the timeline to six months. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, opposed, one. All right, so that passes. Right, are we done? Main motion. And now we have to vote on the motion. So okay. now what you are, that was the, so you just amended the, the main time, motion. The original right. motion. The original motion to six so months. So now um, what is uh, on the table is the ordinance with, um, in front of you, but with the extension to with six extension, months. Yep. With the to extension six months. Okay, any other discussion about that? All in favor of the amended ordinance, a motion, one, two, three, four, five, six, opposed, one. All right, so that passes. Uh, Mike. That's interesting, that was the six months. Okay. All right, it was your motion. No, okay. He went where he thought he could go. <laughs> Your okay. I, are we yes. clear? Well, there, was nice. Is there a, <laughs> who's doing that today? Hello, <laughs> go. Assistant City Attorney yes. Office. She's Good reminding morning. me, and I appreciate this. Um, this is not a unilateral decision by right. the city right. of Eugene. Yeah, really um, right. We had previously discussed with um, their attorneys, and because it's a contract, what you're right. asking for is a contract. So what your amendment does is we take this back to them, um, but we can't unilaterally improve. Right. push this right. on them. So I, that's, that's, yeah. thank you. That's an important clarification for everyone to hear. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mike, you have something else to say? Yeah, about this? two things. Number one, what's the consequence if they say no thank you, we wouldn't care for a six month contract? Mm -hmm. We will be back in front of you to tell you that they said no, thank you. <laughs> and we'll talk about the consequences for that if we can't reach. Well, that's um, kind of what I'm asking. If we can't reach agreement, what are the consequences? If, if the, if November comes and goes, and then they are, and we don't have an agreement, then they continue to operate for a year just kind of under the statute, and then we have some other actions that we could take. But um, it's, it's not as though the gas is turned off or that right. they have to go out the next day and pull the stuff out of our right of way. Um, That's what I was trying to get to in a previous conversation we had, that it isn't, you know, consequence free for us not to make this particular agreement. <clears throat> Correct. I mean, we, we, we need to come to uh, a, a it's, it has to be a mutual agreement with both the franchise as well as the site agreement. I think um, what 
complicates it a little bit is that we've got, if in fact you have some interest, I heard some mention of Berkeley. Um, Berkeley wasn't a part of a site agreement. It wasn't a part of a um, franchise agreement. It was a separate ordinance. And so if in fact there is some interest there, we would be pursuing a three-pronged approach at that time. So you take the current two-pronged that has its own complications and we could potentially add a third. 100% within your purview to discuss that, and if that is something of interest with you, we could look to what we could do within the state of Oregon under building codes. But I just want to make sure that that is clear. That just wouldn't get wrapped into the side agreement or a franchise. It's a separate discussion. So if, um, okay. All right. I think I think we're done with that issue for the moment. Correct. Seeing. You have one more. I know. <laughs> I think so. I, I just, I, I'm just trying to think through the time. I think it's going to be a tough timeline to hit, but we'll do what we can. So we'll work towards that. Um, time, so. If they say yes. Okay. I have Assuming a they say yes, and we're, we won't know that. And then the next time you'll know that, be able to do anything, will be when you come back and break in mid September, which will, and so we're sort of probably November before we're moving forward. So I'm, We'll kind of work through that. Okay, uh, Councilor Syrett, you have one more comment. Yeah, so I, I, I recognize we've thrown you for a loop, City Manager, um, but I mean, I feel, and I think a majority of council, or they wouldn't have voted this way, feel a real sense of urgency around this. And, but we also know, as uh, staff pointed out, that if we need to extend, we have the ability to do an extension on the agreement. So. I mean, I don't think that we've backed ourselves into some untenable corner. I understand that it means you have to rework your timelines. But the six month also puts us in, you know, <coughs> past the knowledge of whether or not there's going to be a special February session, what the governor's going to do. So some of these um, un unanswered questions will be answered before we get to the end of this deadline that we've just adopted here. Okay, fair enough. Thank you all for that. And we will now move on to our fourth item, an ordinance amending and codifying permitted overnight sleeping rest stop program provisions and amending section 4.816 of the Eugene Code 1971. I move to adopt an ordinance amending and codifying permitted overnight sleeping rest stop program provisions and amending section 4.816 of the Eugene Code, 1971. Second. Discussion, comments, Michael? Go yeah, ahead. I just, we're Councilor Clark, either way. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, over that in a way. the, I just wanted to say that uh, I'll vote against this because I don't agree with the placement issues and the change in the placement issues. I've been a part of too many conversations in my ward. I've never once, not one time, not with any constituent, encountered any single person who would be in favor of our changes. So um, I feel a certain duty to represent my constituents, including meetings with 300 people there in very loud opposition to the idea. So, okay. no. Any other comments? And I apologize for continuing to s slip over your name. I have a close friend named Michael Clark, so it just is what rolls off my tongue. Well, you just can't have there too many, go. apparently. Can't have too many. There you go. Really. There you go. Okay, Councillor Semple. Thank you. I'm in favor of these changes. Uh, the rest stop program was a successful pilot, and now we need to keep driving it. Um, we talked about all of, of these pretty well when, when we brought this forward. I think we really need to pass it, and I hope we will. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Taylor. I would like a clarification of the changes we're making. I think the, the placement is one. I would like, while we're voting on this, I would like to know what changes we're making. Can someone, I think, I think we're saying it, that they can be in residential areas and so near, near schools. schools and so forth. I think there are other changes too. I'd like to have a refreshment on that. <clears throat> so there are um, three primary changes. One is related to the um, striking of um, that 
the uh, operator or an entity other than the city will provide at no cost to the city, so that is being struck. So now the city has the capacity to provide some financial support for the garbage toilets and supervision. So that's one. Um, another is related to the ownership um, of properties that can be used as sites. So uh, previously, um, any site had to be owned or leased by the city, a religious institution, a nonprofit, or a business. Um, so that has all been struck, so that is no longer um, a requirement. And then um, the other um, adds that um, any site may be located, uh, may not be located in a residential or uh, area or close to school close to a school unless the city council determines that any potential impacts to the surrounding residences or to the school can be effectively mitigated. So um, it can be located close to a um, school or residential area if council determines that impacts can be mitigated. So those are the three changes. Thank you. Um, I would be all right with saying a go government ownership rather than city ownership, but I'm not, I won't vote for location in residential areas or for just any ownership of anyone. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? All right, all in favor? One, two, three, four, five, opposed? Two, and it passes, thank you, and thank you very much. <coughs> and our final action hopefully will be simple. Uh, Approval of motions relating to the November 5th, 2019 election. Uh, would you? I, I move to direct the city manager to include on a supplemental budget sufficient appropriation uh, to offset by general fund contingency and the reserve for revenue shortfall to produce a voter's pamphlet. Second. Any questions? Yes, Councilor Zelenka. <coughs> So I voted against putting this on the ballot, but since the majority has put it on the ballot, I think people need to be informed about it. So I'm in favor of put, put, <coughs> appropriating sufficient money to put a voter's pamphlet together to explain what the heck they're voting on. Any, so other, any other comments on that? Okay, all in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Excellent. And now the second piece, um, I have two counselors who have volunteered to do this, uh, Councillor Pryor and Councillor Syret. Okay, <clears throat> I move to approve, I move to appoint Councillor Syret and Councillor Pryor to the voters pamphlet proposed proponent committee for the charter amendment that caps the rates and limits the use of the city payroll tax. Second. Uh, any discussion about that? All in Thursday favor? Oh, Clarence. Really <laughs> 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 It'll <I> still win. <laughs> All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Councillor Syret and Councillor Pryor, for volunteering to do that work. One more? Uh, real quick, sorry. You, um, just real quick. Um, Councillor Taylor, you read the motion that was on your agenda regarding funding for the voters pamphlet. In fact, the full motion, and I'm, it, is, it was different on your AIS for some reason, but it was actually for funding of the election as well as the voters um, pamphlet. So the November, 5th, November 5, 2019 election. Um, yeah, so you can either Add the vote separately just to say and include in the funding to pay for the um, uh, our portion of the November 5 election. Okay, I move to pay for pay our part for the November 5th election. Second. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you very much. Thank that's you. Approved. Okay, and that's clear. Thank mm -hmm. you all. We are adjourned. All right.